welcome everyone. Thank you for attending Sandy Spring Garden Club's uh, 2020, April 2021 program, Everything Roses. Uh, I would like to introduce Marge Combs, co-president of the Sandy Spring Garden Club. But before we begin, I would like to ask that all attendees keep themselves muted and uh, during the presentation by any of our speakers today, uh, excluding our Q&A portions, which will be moderated by members of the Garden Club themselves. Thank you very much, Marge. Please. Hi, everyone. We're glad that you could join us this afternoon because this is going to be really a great program that we have planned. But before we begin, I wanted to just say a few words to uh, remind you that we will be having our Sandy Spring Museum Garden Club drive through plant sale on May 15th. The times for pickup are 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., as stated there. And you the plants will be going on sale on our website on May 3rd. Uh, so place your orders early because we sell out fast usually. All orders are prepaid. There's no money exchanged at the drive-thru. So we anticipate to have large flowering hanging baskets, perennials, herbs, vegetables, and some annuals. Now we'd like to ask a favor of you, if you have perennials that need thinning out, consider donating them to the plant sale. We would like at least five of the same type of plant. Now these plants do not have to be in sanitized pots. And if you need pots, you can email the garden club and we'll be able to provide you with some. Uh, so right now, if you have any other questions about the plant sale, please wait to the end of the program. And I'd like to introduce Stephanie Parkhurst, who will say a few words. Stephanie? Great, thank you. Uh, I am gonna quickly share my, whoops, I'll go back here and do it this way, share my screen. Um, all right. Well, I wanna say thank you so much for coming. I know it's gorgeous out there. So uh, we really appreciate your joining us today. Um, before I go ahead uh, with introductions for our speaker, I wanna mention a couple of things. Um, first is I wanna tell you a little bit about our um, September program. And um, let me get back here so you'll have the date in mind. Um, it'll be on September 12th, and it's about uh, eco-friendly ways to decorate in different seasons. In this case, we're gonna talk about fall. So Lauren Pierce, who is the museum's marketing director and her mother, Lori Thomas, the Strawberry Festival Chair, will present on sustainable fall decorating ideas. And I hope you will in, in join us uh, and this mother-daughter duo who have a passion for decorating and for all things fall. They are really focusing their own learning on um, sustainability and that's made them much more conscious about what they used to decorate from season to season. And so in this program, they'll share their tips and their tricks and lead a take-home decorating activity. Now I have to say that our club plans and hopes that we'll be able to meet in person in September, but that again will be a, a call that has to be made as we approach um, the date. And it will depend on the safety guidance that we have at the time. Um, registration will start at the um, beginning of August. So keep an eye out for any announcements on that. Um, second, today, um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can hang on to them until the end of the program because we're gonna wait until the end to um, have Carol answer any questions that you might have. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Carol Allen, who is also known as the Orchid Lady. For those of you, <laughs> you're infamous, um, who have joined us before, uh, you know, um, we had a presentation on orchids and spring ephemerals that Carol has 
provided us. And she's a very entertaining, engaging uh, presenter. She has over 30 years of experience in the horticultural industry and her special interests are in landscape design and native plants, along with obviously a few other things. She's taught courses and really enjoys helping people understand how to care for their plants. I also think one of the really fun things about Carol is that she likes to share her firsthand experience with <laughs> planting, growing, and learning what works and what doesn't work <laughs> in her very own gardens. And she shares her wisdom with us. So today, um, she is going to be sharing her knowledge and excitement about everything roses. So Carol, I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over to you. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the great introduction. Let me see if I can do this again, folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we can do this. We can do this. Yes. All right. Come on. Ooh. Come on. Here we go. Uh, and presenter view. So everyone should see this beautiful big red rose bush and nothing else, right? No little notes off to the side, right? Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. All right. So roses, oh my gosh, you, do you realize, and, and I didn't until, well, many years ago, that roses have been cultivated for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course they started out as medicinal because you know, why not? Everything was medicinal. And now of course they've been bred in many, many different species been bred together, creating hybrids that we can have in our garden. So one of the things that I do for my woody plant classes is I do include the, um, the family and the genus. So rosaceae and the genus is Rosa. And what I love about looking at the Latin binomials is the fact that a lot of times they'll tell the history of the plant. They, they take you back to the first person who named it. Well, roses have been all around so long that they don't have the history. They're just like, it's been there forever, guys. All right, so Rosa. And if you walk up to a strange plant that maybe uh, there's a lot of folks that like to go in like old estates and, and churchyards, believe it or not, and find these old roses. So how do you know that you're looking at a rose bush? It may or may not have thorns. That may not be the distinguishing characteristic. So, so you need to know, all right? Of course, we know in our climate, our roses are deciduous. They drop their leaves. And the, the leaves, which are compound and are made up of leaflets, are alternate, okay? So they're not opposite, they're alternate on the stem. And when we identify woody plants, opposite or alternate is like the first cut. I mean, evergreen deciduous, but alternate or opposite. So this is alternate and is oddly pinnate. And that means that each leaf and this whole thing on this person's palm is a leaf, all right? That is the point of attachment to the stem. All right, and it's oddly pinnate. It's got five leaflets, all right? So depending on the cultivar, depending on the species, you could have seven to nine, or in this case, it's five. Sometimes you have to look at the mature foliage to actually see what the real number is. Sometimes juvenile foliage will have a smaller number of these leaflets. The leaflets are usually from one to two inches, tip to base, give or take, all right? depending on the hybrid and depending on the species behind it. And they're serrate, they've got these little toothed edges, all right? Generally they're bright green above. And if you flip it over on the underside, it's a paler green. And that depth of green color varies depending on the hybrid. So there are some that are more glaucous and more blue green, and there are some that are darker green depending. But pretty much you're gonna have alternate compound leaflets with serrate leaves, okay? And that's gonna say, maybe that's a rose I'm looking at, all right? Okay, so let's talk about types of roses. Now, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna give the disclaimer right off the top that when you talk to rose experts, you're going to get many, many, many different opinions, okay? So even though I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to break down the different kinds of roses, Another rose expert may say, oh, no, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, you know how two people can get together on the same subject and just, 
All right, so this happens with roses too. So I want to talk about, I want to start talking about hybrid tea roses because I think that for a lot of us, this is like the epitome. All right, hybrid teas are what they describe as high centered blooms. Okay, so instead of the bloom being kind of pancake like, it kind of is higher in the center. You can kind of see it there on this piece rose. All right, and definitely you can see it on the bud because those center petals form this, this pointy bud. So they're high center blooms. They've been bred to give long stems for cutting. All right, presentation. The shrub usually is tall with open canes. All right, so it doesn't, it's not bushy. It's more, more cane-like, all right? The colors are, the, the colors are many, many, many. The flowers have been bred to be large. Um, and when you, when you look for modern tea roses, you want to go after that disease resistance. Now, modern tea roses and disease resistance. I am an aficionado of um, old roses. So I'm afraid that I'm going to give you some heritage roses in this talk. I'm sorry, guys. This is what I love. So you're going to get some of the old roses. And my thought is, is that if Josephine Bonaparte had it in her garden 200 years ago, and it's still around, it's tough rose. And it's a good way of thinking about, I've only got room for three roses in my garden. I don't have much sun. What am I going to choose? Oh my gosh, so many different roses. Choose the ones that have been around for a while because you know that they're gonna to be tough plants. So I want to bring your attention to our picture here. This is Peace, Peace Rose. I think everybody knows it. This soft ivory with the blushes of yellow and peachy colors and pinks. This was hybridized somewhere between 1935 and 1939 by Francis Meland, and pardon my French, I don't speak it very well. So in it, he bred it before the war. And when he knew that the German invasion in France was imminent, he sent cuttings to Italy. Um, I'm trying to remember all the, all the countries, but, but the United States was one of them. So he sent cuttings of this precious peace rose right before World War II. And they were received by Conrad Pyle, who is a rose grower. The original name was Madame A. Meland, which I believe was Francis Milan's grandmother or it was relative. But uh, Conrad Pyle released the rose in 1945 at the conclusion of the war, and it was named Peace. So this is classic rose. It's like, if you're gonna have a rose, you gotta have Peace Rose. Mm -hmm. All right, but some other hybrid teas are very worthy of growing. I love Mr. Lincoln. He is one of, this is one of the best red roses of any kind of rose. Um, it was bred by Herbert Swim and was grown by Weeks Rose Growers, and it was released in 1964. It is fragrant because as far as I'm concerned, if it's a rose, it had better be fragrant. And it is wonderfully repeat bloomer. So when grown well, this not only gives you that spring flush, but it will bloom a couple of flushes throughout the year. To me, that's important. If I'm giving up my sun space, I want it to be fragrant and I'm gonna think twice if it's just a one-time bloomer. However, there are some cool old roses that are one-time bloomers. So next to Mr. Lincoln is Tropicana. I had Tropicana, my mother had Tropicana in her garden when I was growing up. Um, so this was bred by a Mr. Tantau in Germany in 1960 and was introduced by Jackson and Perkins in 1962. So again, long blooming, very fragrant, and, can, and carries many, many awards of different kinds for its excellence. Now, I love the blue tones. And as a, a, as a child, again, in my mother's garden, she had sterling silver. And I was just enchanted by that lavendery blue rose. So this rose was introduced in 1957. It was the first lavender rose. So this is the icebreaker here and was hybridized by a woman, Gladys Fisher. And it is also fragrant. I can't remember about the repeat blooming on it though, but oh my gosh, even just a one flush of those lavender blooms has my, takes my breath away. The other one that I want to bring to your attention again, this is hybrid teas, is Chicago piece. So sometimes in the plant world, we get what's called a sport. 
it's an offshoot where the genetics for whatever reason changes a little bit and it has a different attribute. In this case, Chicago Peace has much more of that peachier color, uh, much more of the rose color. This was found in 1956 and was introduced by Star Roses. And it's not long on fragrance, but if you want more of that peachy pink punch, Chicago Rose is gonna give you that color. So now let's look at Floribunda. So what is a Floribunda? Well, again, here you get different rose experts, all right, putting them in different categories. It used to be called a hybrid polyantha. So this is a cross between Rosa chinensis, which is the basic species behind our tea roses, and Rosa multiflora, which is the rose that we usually typically call a polyantha. And so what are you gonna get when you put those two together? Well, what the breeders were looking for was roses with a hardiness. So I spent part of my childhood in Rochester, New York. Jackson and Perkins was actually just down, down the road in the middle of the state. So that was kind of good. Um, but up in that neck of the woods, some of these roses were of questionable hardiness. And I can remember the old Italian gardeners in my neighborhood with their, with their tree roses. They would dig them up, lay them down, cover them with leaves and tarps and straw to bring those tree roses over the winter. So I actually had the, the experience of seeing where roses were of questionable hardiness. And maybe it was a variety that you particularly wanted. So that's where the breeders started breeding Floribundas for harvest, for, for hardiness and for ease of upkeep. So what do they bring you? They bring you smaller, stockier, more rigid shrubs, all right, more shrubbier, stockier shrubs with an abundance of smaller flowers with a very long bloom time. And where the hybrid teas may be singletons on a long stalk, your floribundas are going to be more of a cluster, but still give you a good sized flower. So let's look at a few of them. Iceberg is probably, well, it's in the top 10 roses in the world. So this is one of the best roses by rose experts. And that's called Iceberg. Um, it was introduced in 1958 by a German rose breeder, Riemer Cordes. And my, again, my German is about as, as bad as my French. So my apologies to you guys. So Riemer Cordes, um, and it is known to be extremely prolific and it's fragrant. So clusters of these white petal upon petal upon petal blossoms in great profusion and fragrant. Now, another one that I particularly like because of the peachy pink color in the center is Grus an Aachen. And this goes all the way back to 1909, 1909. It is only lightly fragrant, but again, makes up for it with profuse blooming. And this was bred by L. Wilhelm Hinner in Germany. So these roses are still in the trade. You can still get them. Some of these older roses, you have to work a little bit harder to find but they're worth it because remember, if they've been around this long, that means they've got that disease resistance built in. So moving on to Granda Flores. Well, if you know Latin, you know Grand is big, Flora is flowers. So now we're going for a mixed group of hybrids with hybrid tea and Floribundas in the parentage. So they've been back crossed. They can be cluster flowered like the Floribundas or born with single stem like the hybrid teas. So the breeders wanted to take the best traits of both of these different kinds of roses, hybrid teas and floribundas, and put them together so you would have bigger flowers. Um, the blooms look a little bit more like the hybrid teas and being high centered, um, and, but they're born on long stemmed clusters when they're cluster blooms. So you get a little bit long stem. Generally, they are repeat blooming and usually they carry a nice fragrance. The plants can be tall, up to seven feet, depending on the cultivar, and they show some good disease resistance. So this would, this would be the rows that you would place at the back of your border and put your perennials down in front. The one I feature in this slide is called About Face, and it was bred by Tom Carruff in, and released in 2005. So this is actually a modern rose. 
It was grown and introduced by Weeks Roses. It has a eh, slight fragrance, but it is a repeat bloomer. And it has that wonderful, those wonderful yellow kind of with a little peachy overtone blooms. Definitely looks like they are, have long enough stems for cutting. So a good, a good rose. Again, back of the border can get big. All right, one of the most famous of the Grand Flores is Queen Elizabeth. And this was bred by Dr. Walter Lammerts in the United States, and it was re released in 1954. Now, Queen Elizabeth ascended to the throne in 1952, so there's a little bit of incongruity there on the timings that I found in my research, but it was uh, named Queen Elizabeth as she, when she became queen. Um, it is moderately fragrant, all right? but it does give this profusion of bloom from spring to fall. And you can see if that's a standard like four foot or five foot fence, that baby's a good two feet above that. So again, these are larger roses, rose shrubs, but again, the profusion of bloom and even with a slight fragrance, that's gonna knock your socks off when you walk into the garden. So now I wanna move on to shrub roses. Now, shrub roses is kind of a catch-all term, um, extremely variable, they're all hybrids. And this is the category that includes the David Austin roses. So you're looking for a lot of diversity, but in this group of roses, the breeders got their winter hardiness, okay? You do have to search out each, each plant individually to make sure it's gonna be hardy, but we're in the mid-Atlantic states, so pretty much everything I'm talking about is going to be hardy here. There's only one coming up that is of questionable hardiness. Um, so the breeders, to get this shrub rose, crossed old rose types, and I'm going to get into some of those old rose types, with modern roses, because particularly what David Austin was looking for, he wanted this profusion of petals like an old centrifolia, okay? And he wanted fragrance back into roses because hybrid teas were getting, were very flamboyant, but we were getting away from good disease resistance, this is when I was younger, and away from fragrance. And David Austin wanted to bring back some of those qualities. And that's why the David Austins are in the shrub rose category. So a lot of these will be repeat blooming, will be fragrant, but they vary in flower style and growth habit, okay? And the one that I've featured here, I just, I love that complex petals, right? It's not a hybrid tea look, it's an old rose look. Um, this is Wisely, it is a David Austin, and even though it looks like an old rose, it was released in 2008, so it is a modern rose. It is fragrant, thank you, I love that fragrance. It is repeat blooming, and it creates a pretty good sized arching shrub. So this is not gonna be a column, it's not gonna be a ball, it's going to be a fountain with arching stems. So when you, when you think about getting one of these David Austin roses, um, remember it's a shrub rose, so let that stick in your mind. It's not gonna be diminutive, nor do you wanna to try to keep it small through pruning. It's a big plant, all right? All right, two of my favorites, Westerland, all right? And that is a wonderful, it's got this wonderful ripple to the petals. It has that shaded um, medium orange to kind of a bright orangey color. It was released in 1969. And again, this was bred by Reamer Cordes in Germany. And this is wonderfully fragrant. This shrub in my, in my yard, gets over my head. So I would say a good six feet and that's with, that's with the proper pruning in the spring. So it's a big guy. You could almost probably use this as a semi climber, a, a short climber, um, because it does have that growth habit. The other one on the right hand side is a little bit smaller bloom. This is Buff Beauty. And this dates back to about 1939. It is again, wonderfully, wonderfully fragrant. It was bred by Anne, well, it was released by Anne Bentall. And there's a whole wonderful story about how she became a rose breeder. 
um, and is sometimes considered to be a musk rose, which is another type of heritage rose. So musk roses are, you can kind of imagine, they're gonna be high in the fragrance department, and so is Buff Beauty. Now let's talk about some of our more modern roses. These are both David Austin's. Um, Abraham Darby was released in 1985 by David Austin. It has that wonderful old rose look, but it's on a larger flower. Some of the old roses are pretty tiny. This has a good sized flower. It is a repeat bloomer. It is a good sized shrub, all right? And it is a David Austin. Gertrude Jekyll, all right, released in 1986 is also a repeat bloomer and fragrant. And again, both of these are shrub roses. They're good sized roses. You want to allocate plenty of space if you want that look in your garden. And you can see that Gertrude Jekyll, that is an eyeful, that's beautiful. All right, moving on to polyantha roses. These, now, now we're shrinking back down. The shrub roses were big and now the polyanthas are a little bit smaller may be better for small spaces. So we know these as low growing shrubs. The flower size has shrunk and now we're getting them in clusters. So their claim to fame is massive amounts of, of flowers um, on sturdy stems that aren't gonna flop in the rain usually, all right? But they can be grown in containers. So now you're looking at what can I grow on my balcony? What can I grow in my townhouse? I don't have room for a shrub rose, but I still, I still want a rose. I still want it to smell like a rose. Maybe I don't need to cut it in a vase, but I want it for my balcony. The polyanthas are gonna be a good place to go. Smaller shrubs, even though they have smaller flowers, they still have, a lot of them have that fragrance. They're low growing, compact, very hardy. Now you will have to go from variety to variety, hybrid to hybrid, to look for that disease resistance because the polyantha roses are grouped by their growth habit and their breeding, not their disease resistance. But I can point you to the fairy, which is probably the, the most famous polyantha rose. Uh, again, this is out of Ann Bentall's blooming or growing, and it was released in 1932. So again, it's been around long enough this is gonna be fairly disease resistant. It is a repeat bloomer. I um, can't remember if it's fragrant or not. I think I remember it's not that long on fragrant, but if you want a container rose, the fairy is a good one or an edging rose if you have a larger, a larger um, growing space. Another uh, polyantha is Excellence von Schubert. And again, this dates back to 1900. I love it. Is this okay? Kind of breaks the mold of it small and compact because this guy can get from four to six feet. Oops. And it can be very prickly. So the amount of thorniness on these different kinds of roses varies. They're not all this like the, the long stemmed red roses that you get from the florist. Sometimes they're very, very prickly. And this one is very, very prickly. It has that old rose look of many, 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 many petals. It is fragrant, but it's a big guy. It's still a polyantha because of its breeding. And then Pierre Dar, or Dor, uh, was released in 1875. And again, old rose. It is fragrant and it is disease resistant. And I think it's a little bit more compact than Excellence von Schubert, who is a little enthusiastic. But again, that delicate white shading into peachy pink in the middle. That's a beautiful rose. And then there's Clotilde Supert. And again, she was released in 1888, fragrant. This one tops out at about 18 inches. So again, we're back like the fairy rose. This is going to be something for containers. It's got, it's been around for a long, long time. It's going to have that disease resistance. And the plus point, it's nearly thornless. So smaller flowers, cluster bloomer, fragrant, stays compact, score in my book. So a great one for containers and for small spaces. All right. 
So I hope I'm not dazzling you with all of these names. Um, to me, they're, they're ones I know. So they're, they're, am I'm in my comfort zone here. All right, so let's move to the huge category of old antique or heritage roses. All right, so these are all classes of roses that existed prior to 1867. This is the division that the rose experts make. All right, some of them date back to the Roman Empire. All right, we've got in this group, we've got species roses, we've got the albas, the bourbons, centrifolias, damasks, eglantines, gallicas, mosses, nosettes, portlands. I'm not going to talk about all of them. All right. You've got in this group, you've got a huge range of sizes from one foot tall to 50 feet tall. All right. Some repeat bloom, some don't. But good fragrance is usually what was the motiva motivation for people to keep these roses around because they smelled good. And let's face it, um, before 1867, people might have bathed once a week, maybe. <laughs> they needed those fragrances. Okay, can I just say that? I can just say that. They needed that fragrance. All right. <laughs> now, in this slide, I'm featuring Louise Odier. I'm probably saying that wrong, which is a bourbon rose. Okay, so that's the subgroup in the Antiquer Heritage Rose group. This baby gets to five feet tall. It will rebloom. It's technically a bourbon rose and it is moderately fragrant, but look at those lovely, lovely pinky lavender petals. So pretty. All right, one of my absolute favorite, you've got to have this, if you have any roses at all, you've got to have this rose is Zephyrine Drohern or Drohine. Um, this is a bourbon rose. It is wonderfully fragrant. Oh, it's the kind of fragrance you just want to like fall into face first. It is thornless. Yes, let's hear it for thornless. This is a, actually a climbing rose, so it will need support. It has been around since 1868. And I don't recall that it gave me many, many flushes of bloom. It gave me that good June bloom. I think I might've gotten a little bit more right before Christmas because of our mild weather but it wasn't one of the ones that just keeps on going. But when it blooms, oh, that fragrance is so wonderful. And I could work with it and not draw back bloody hands. So that's always a plus in my point. So I, then on the flip side, look at Apothecary's Rose. This we know from historic records dates back to before 1310. That's pretty cool. We still have that rose. It's a Gallica, technically. It is once blooming. So if, you, if your interest is in medicinal plants, this rose belongs in your garden because this is why it's called Apothecary's Rose. It was used to compound, um, dr well, drugs, but, but remedies, remedies and, and to tonics and, and whatnot. So it is nicely fragrant. It's a single rose. So it looks much more like, um, like a, what we would call like a prairie rose. And I'm gonna get to those too. Because if you uh, wanna grow native plants, yes, there are roses for you. All right. One of the most fragrant rose is Rose Direct. Um, it is technically, it's a Portland, which is that subcategory. It is fragrant. This one will repeat bloom. Um, and we think from the records that maybe it was introduced about 1880. Now, of all of the heirloom roses that I grew, and I grow, some see some were past tense. This didn't do as well for me as I would have liked, but I lack the number one thing in my garden that you need to really optimize the performance of your rose, which is full, full, full sun. So, the Rose Direct did not do as well. And I take it that it is the reason it did is because I don't have enough sun for it. But fragrance, oh my gosh, flowers weren't that big, but um, very, very beautiful, very, very fragrant. Then another one that has history behind it, again, is Great Maiden's Blush. Technically, it is an Alba Rose. It is highly fragrant and it we know from the historical record that it predates 1400s. 
This is again like the apothecary rose, it's a once bloomer. So if you're into history, there are roses that support that interest of looking back and seeing what was in Josephine Bonaparte's garden. This was there, more than likely, this was there. So all of those great rose gardens of, of the past had some of these historical heirloom roses in them. All right, so let's talk about climbing roses because, oh my goodness, we can do so much cool, so many cool things with climbing roses, but you kind of have to know what you're doing with them. So selection, you might've figured is, is like number one. So climbing roses are going to be roses that have been bred for vigor, all right? They're very, very vigorous. They grow on very tall canes, so they're not bushy, they're cane growing. And those canes can range from eight to 20 feet. And this is what you want. Now, they are not necessarily self-supporting. Sometimes they'll wind their way through trees and if there's enough branches for them to kind of be supported by, it'll work. But if you're just starting out, you're going to need something to support them, like this Joseph's coat on this fence. And when you think about it, it's almost good because at some point that fence needs painting and you wanna be able to gently take that rose and lay it down so the painters can get in there. All right, so we know that they're very vigorous. We know that they're very tall. Um, sometimes you will get like there is a, there's a Mr. Lincoln that is not only a shrub rose, it's a climbing rose as well. So it's been bred a little bit differently for those longer canes. And in general, the experts say that the individual blooms on climbing roses can be finer quality and larger than on the bush form. Boy, if I get some nice flowers, I'm happy. I don't compare them. Um, a lot of times your climbers will give you a really good flush in the spring. And if they repeat, it's going to be a little bit more sparse, maybe with a second fall crop of good heavy bloom, all right? Um, generally they have larger flowers and fewer flowers than the next group, which are rambling roses. So let's talk about Joseph's coat. I love Joseph's coat. I think this enchanted me when I was a little girl because the flowers change color. And I think that's cool, all right? Um, and that's why it's called Joseph's coat. So you may get those, um, those uh, catalogs from our less than um, exemplary nurseries and they'll have Joseph's coat. And you know those photographs are, are enhanced, right? You look at those, you know, I, that's not the way it looks. It's been, it's been enhanced, it's been colored. Well, Joseph's coat really looks like this. So <laughs> if you get those, those catalogs, this is one you can actually, actually believe. So it was bred by David L. Armstrong and Herbert Swim, and it was released before 1963. Moderate fragrance, pretty good repeat bloom. It's a wonderful, wonderful climbing rose. But of course, New Dawn, New Dawn is like the epitome of a climbing rose. So that pale blush pink, it was released before 1930 or about 1930. It does repeat bloom. It is fragrant. And it's one of the most highly awarded roses in the rose kingdom. So if you have only one rose, climbing rose, maybe do, New Dawn should be it. However, then there's Don Juan which next to Mr. Lincoln, those are our two hottest red roses that are available for growing in the home. All right, so Don Juan and Mr. Lincoln. I did a fence for a client and we had, it was about 30 feet, 40 feet long. And I did Mr. Lincoln's all the way down. And when that thing bloomed, huh, smelled good, looked beautiful. Don Juan would have been one for a taller uh, trellis. But so Mr. Lincoln and Don Juan, if you like that red rose, these are your two. So Don Juan was released in 1958. It does do a lot of continuous bloom. So sometimes like New Dawn, you'll have a heavy spring bloom. You get a little sporadic flushing through the summer and then you get a good late season bloom. Well, Don Juan actually does some pretty good continuous bloom. So these are all factors that you would consider in purchasing a a climbing rose. And of course, David Austin's not to be outdone. 
In the David Austin Roses, we have Graham Thomas, which was released in 1983. Highly fragrant. You can see that the yellow shading of the, of the flowers as they open brilliant and fade to a lighter color. And that's pretty darn dramatic. And it's a good doer. Most of David Austin's roses are going to be very good, sturdy plants, vigorous plants with some disease resistance to them. But now I mentioned rambling roses. So what are they? Well, they've been bred for a little bit different use. The flowers are usually smaller, more cluster blooming when you compare them to climbers. Um, and a lot of times they're once blooming, but, but when they do it, they do it really, really well. The canes are a little bit more pliable than the climbing roses. And they were actually bred for securing onto pillars and pergolas. So American pillar rose, all right, is the one that I feature on this slide. And even though it's once blooming, it does it really, really well. It was introduced by Dr. Walter Van Fleet in the United States in 1902. So again, it's been around for a long time. It's gonna be a good sturdy rose with some disease resistance. So I'm gonna have a little bit of how-to on pruning ramblers and climbers when I, when I get to that section. So I won't leave you in the lurch. All right, I wanna finish up this particular section with knockout roses. Okay, oh, these were bred by Bill Radler of Wisconsin, and they were bred for in improved disease resistance. Now, they are not short and shrubby. Um, they can get up to about anywhere from four to seven feet tall. Um, they can withstand a little bit of summer pruning to take top down a little bit but you have to be careful. They do bloom throughout the season in flushes. You get flush, flush. So when you go through after your spring flush, you deadhead, you cut down to an outward facing sprout. And within another month or so, you're going to have another flush of flowers. So they're really, really good for just continual bloom. And as you can tell, because they've been overused by the landscape industry, all right? There are actually 10 colors available. Um, blush, the knockout, which is kind of what you see in front of you. It's kind of a vermilion red. There's a double knockout. There's a pink, there's a pink double. There's sunny, there's coral, there's peachy, and there's white. Now I haven't seen all of those colors available in commerce. And I'll be honest, after I've, everything I've told you about roses, don't buy knockout roses, okay? There's better things out there. But they are ubiquitous in our landscapes now. And I'm gonna tell you a reason at the end why maybe you wanna shy away from that. All right, so let's, let's briefly talk about species roses. So you didn't know this, there are 360 species of roses and four subgenera, whoa. So we've got 11 sections in subgenus rosa, and that includes Banksii, which is, comes from China, Carolinii, which is North American, Chinensis, which comes from China and Burma, and Galacatnii, which originated in Western Asia and Europe. Okay, so let's look at a little bit closer. All right, Banksii, Lady Banks Rose. This is the climbing rose of, of, of myth and legend, all right? And this is the one that in our climate might not do that well. We get, our winters get a little bit cold and our Lady Banks roses have got to have that special spot where they're a little bit more protected, self-facing wall. So it's kind of this scrambly sh shrubby mess. A, a friend of mine has one and it's beautiful and he dotes on it. But when I look at it, it's, a, it's kind of a viney shrubby mess. Um, but when it blooms, oh my gosh, um, it's, May for, it's May blooming and it perfumes his entire yard. So a little bit shy on the hardiness. It is a classic, classic climbing, scrambling rose. Um, maybe worth the pampering, but notice it gets to 20 feet. And yes, he has it scrambling up a, an aluminum frame trellis that he had custom made for this plant and it goes two stories tall. Pretty cool. All right, so if you want to have nothing but native plants in your yard, 
bingo, we have the Carolina rose, sometimes called the pasture rose. So this is a single rose, all right? Very, very pretty. It is native to Eastern North America, has a light little fragrance to it, pretty pink flowers, um, blooms kind of early summer. It, um, I have, I had this. I actually, it was on my property when I moved in. And as the trees grew and I got more shade, it died out. So I kind of regret that I haven't brought that back in into a sunnier spot. Mine got no more than about three to four feet. Um, it does need full sun and that's why I lost it because the trees got bigger and shadier and it likes basically good garden soil. It doesn't need moist, moist soil like, you know, swamp, but just doesn't want to dry out. So it's a small shrubby rose. It's very thorny, it's very spiny, but um, I miss having it. And if you want to venture into native plants, you've got a rose that's waiting for you. So let's look at Chinensis. This is the China rose. And this has been bred for ch in China for ornamental use for centuries, okay? It can get anywhere from three to six and a half feet, depending on the breeding line. And it's known for its profusion of bloom and that wonderfully complex flower, all right? In direct, direct opposition to our prairie rose, which is that single row of flowers. A single, single row of petals, all right? The Gallica roses, um, this would include the Gallicas, the Centrifolias, Damask roses, and Portland roses are kind of in this one area for the section of rose species. You can see very, very, very complex petal arrangement, moderate sized flowers, highly fragrant. So much so that Damask roses are still grown in France and they are harvested for perfume. So that is a whole field of damask roses and they are being um, harvested for perfumery. So yes, you too can have damask roses in your backyard if you have enough sun, all right. So Rosa Ragusa is a, a, a rose that likes beachy sandy soil. It originates in Eastern Asia. It is suckering. Um, it's probably, it's not for small spaces. It, it does, I've seen a lot of these planted, say out on the Eastern shore, um, Delaware on the beaches, um, even though it's not native, it adapts very nicely to that. It is well known for its very beautiful rose hips, it makes beautiful, beautiful rose hips, gets to about four and a half, five feet tall, and is very, very fragrant. It's also very, very spiny. So again, if you've got a place out on the shore, this might be a rose that would create a little bit of a hedge for you. It would keep small children out, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Now the rose I just love and adore that we don't do well in here in our area in mid-Atlantic states is Rosa Glocka, because look at that foliage. Oh man, that is so, so pretty. It doesn't like our heat and humidity. I have not been horribly successful with it. I have friends who dote on them. They get them to work, not me. Um, so it's native to South and Central Europe and it's grown for its beautiful foliage and its beautiful rose hips. So you can see it's a single pink, all right? And it's gonna do that one flush, um, but that's a beautiful rose. So I'd have to move North in order to grow that one. So beautiful, beautiful rose. So I've presented a whole bunch of different kinds of roses for you. Um, I've run you from, from climbers to everything in between. So let's talk about how do I grow this well, Carol? All right, so <laughs> this by the way is the Rose Garden at Brookside Gardens, all right? So we have that in our backyard. So if, you, if you're like me and you live in a shady backyard, you can go to Brookside Gardens and get your rose fix, all right? They do a great <laughs> job there. So, for best results, you are going to plant them in full screaming sun. Yes, I know that tag on the, on, the, on the bush when you go shopping for it says part sun, maybe in Florida. Okay, not here. We really want that full sun. And the reason we want that full sun is because it helps prevent black spot and powdery mildew, two of our fungal diseases. So full sun, good air circulation is gonna be important for us because we do live in the powdery mildew center of the world, okay? 
we do powder and it'll do really, really well here in the mid-Atlantic states. Now, as far as soil goes, you don't need anything really, really special. What I would call is just good garden soil, okay? If you've got solid clay, add some coarse organic matter to open up the drainage because these, these roses do not like wet feet. Um, keep a mulch on them, all right? So any one of the organic wood chip or wood shredded mulch, shredded wood mulches is fine, maybe about two to three inches. Don't stack it up around the, the crown, give it a little bit of breathing room. But definitely you wanna keep that soil moist and cool and then water as needed. So roses are probably going to want to have something around um, maybe one to two inches of water per week. Now, normally we don't have a, a lack of water lately in the mid-Atlantic states, but if we do have those prolonged droughts, water your roses, okay? And drip irrigation will be perfect on this because overhead irrigation is going to leave water on the leaves and that's gonna encourage your fungal diseases, not the direction that we wanna go. Um, as far as your soil goes, our, our, our mother soil has a pH of about 6.5, that's where you want to be. It can take a little bit more acid, can take up to 7.0, but not alkaline. Um, fertilize, there's a lot of different ways of fertilizing and every grower is going to have their own special protocol that they want. Um, Espoma makes a rose uh, fertilizer that is largely organic in composition. And that would be a good fertilizer for you to use. So you would fertilize probably by now because the roses have already flushed out. And then you can be fertilized probably every three to four weeks and stop about two months before first frost. So that's a first frost for us is October 15th. So sometime around mid-August, uh, mid stop fertilizing. This allows the new growth to harden off so that that frost doesn't burn it. Not what you want, okay? I've talked about mulch, talked about water. Let's talk about pruning, all right? Now, you should have already done this, just saying, uh -huh. all right? So rose pruning is something that you can do um, when it, it's January or February, and you see those buds just starting to show color and break. And that's the perfect time to prune them. Yes, you can prune them now, it gets a little bit more mooderish with all the new growth and you have to be careful you don't break off the new growth. So when I approach a rose bush, there is a, there is a priority. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the dead and the diseased or any damaged wood. Then I'm gonna stand back, all right? Rose pruning is a, 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 a contemplative exercise, all right? You do a lot of looking and thinking. All right, then I'm gonna stand back and I'm going to remove the branches that grow into the center of the plant. So what you wanna do is you wanna open that plant up so that you can get good air circulation to the center. If you've got a lot of inward growth. You wanna kind of alleviate some of that, all right? So that it looks a little bit more like this vase shape rather than that snarl, okay? So think twice before you cut because you can't glue them back on. So you're going to open up the center of the plant. You're going to remove any crossing or rubbing branches. All right, sometimes we can get wounding from that. And then if you've got suckers that come up from the graft below, you want to cut them out. So one of the things you want to know on your rose bush is where is your bud union or your graft? Because anything that sprouts out from below the bud union is going to be that root mass and it's going to be probably be a single red and it was put you know, the fancy graft was put on that that uh, rootstock because the rootstock added vigor to the plant okay then once you've taken out the sucker growth the crosses the rubbers the inward growth the dead the damaged now you're going to shape the plant and this is done with a very very light hand okay again you can't glue it back on once you once you've pruned it all right on hybrid teas, grandiflores, floribundas, you want to prune to about, I would say, probably not 12, but maybe somewhere around 24 inches in height. Um, you want to leave nine to 12 large half inch diameter healthy canes. So 
generally, if I have, when I'm at this point, I'm at shaping, I will rotate out and I will cut out maybe one or two of my largest canes every year and have that bush replenish from the base. If I've got little tiny weeny canes, I will probably cut those out to favor those heftier canes. And again, you want an outward vase shape, okay? Um, when you cut, you don't want to leave, here's your shoot, you don't want to leave a lot of that, that branch left, neither do you want to cut right on top of that bud. That bud is going to die. So you want to have about maybe one quarter of an inch above the bud, a slanted cut, all right? And that's your finished cut. That's what your finished cuts should look like. So that's hybrid cheese, grandiflorus floribundus. I would say um, if you've got knockout roses, I use that same prescription for knockout roses. On um, heritage roses, shrub roses, species roses, prune lightly, uh, removing no more than one third of the growth. And miniature roses only need minimal pruning. It's gonna depend on when was the last time you pruned it, all right? But keep in mind that only take off one third rule, okay? So that's actually pretty straightforward. Remember, look at it a lot more than you cut it. And you're certainly not going to use any electric machines pruning roses at all, ever, all right? A good set of pruners and some leather gauntlet gloves are gonna be what you're gonna to want to have when you go into rose pruning. So let's talk about pests and diseases, all right? So first of all, you're going to buy for, for disease resistance. You're gonna plant them in full sun. You're gonna give them good air circulation. You're gonna keep them mulched. You're gonna keep them irrigated. And if they do drop diseased leaves, you're gonna to try to keep those up. Don't blow them. Really rake or pick up those diseased leaves. Everybody wants to blow, grab that blower. No, uh-uh. I'm anti-blower for sure. So what do we have here? Well, this is black spot. That upper left-hand corner is black spot. And again, you want, to, you want to buy for disease resistance. You want to buy for roses that are not prone to black spot. And this middle picture is powdery mildew. So this is usually a one-two punch that we get midsummer on our roses. And again, full sun, drip irrigation, not overhead irrigation and good air circulation, you're gonna get that with pruning. It's going to help you avoid that. Now, you can use regular applications of fungicide. If you're going to be applying fungicide at about a seven to 14 day interval, that's like the rest of your life, you're, you're putting fungicide on the roses. You can use conventional chemistry for that, daconil, fungenol, mancozeb, clearies, and others or you can use the organic method, and that is spraying with sulfur, pure sulfur, neem oil, or a summer weight horticultural oil. Make sure that you spray when your temperatures are below 90 degrees, because all three of those sprays will react badly in the heat. And actually, most of the conventional chemistry also will sometimes burn foliage in excessive heat. So you're gonna wanna get out there before the birds are singing if you're going to do any spraying. And remember, pesticides, you've got flowers in bloom. You have to think we have pollinators. So think about that. Now, this picture in the upper right, this is a, a virus disease. This is rose mosaic. If you have this on your rose, remove the rose and destroy it. There is no cure. It is, it is Contagious, okay, it can be spread from rose to rose. So if you get a rose that has this mosaic pattern on it, all right, all that yellow kind of patterning, you want to remove that rose from your garden. And now this is rose rosette down here in the lower left-hand corner. And this is, this is what comes from taking knockout roses and putting them on every street corner, all right? This is a virus disease, there is no cure for it. It is spread by area phyid mites, which are the very dickens themselves to control. You would need conventional chemistry to control area phyid mites. So if you have rose rosette on your roses, destroy the rose. And I'm gonna say, you're not gonna plant roses again. 
highly contagious. If your roses have it, that means it's in the neighborhood. So you've got that source of the disease. So sad, sad. I go in a lot of parking lots and I see masses of, of knockout roses with rose rosette. And the landscape company doesn't realize that that is the disease source for all of the neighboring rose gardens. So this is a big problem. Two little problems when you talk about this one, that's a big problem. Aphids, spray it off with a strong stream of water, just hose them down, power wash it. And this is the damage from rose slugs. Now I've gotten over going, ew, I will, I will squish those little, those little caterpillars. There are little tiny green caterpillars either on the top or on the bottom and squish them. Start looking for them now. They are little tiny green things. If you see this kind of window pane damage, doesn't go all the way through the leaf. It, it's either, it's just one section of the leaf, just the epidermis, squash it. You can use either a horticultural oil spray, a neem oil spray. You can use a product called Botanigard, which is a, um, it's a, a bacteria, or you can use Spinosad, Captain Jack's dead bug, bug brew, which will also, if you've got a lot of roses and you've got a lot of problem with rose slug, you can spray with that. But remember, you're spraying flowering plants. So please spray safely um, and not when your rose is in bloom. So that concludes my, my presentation. All right, thank you very much for your attention. And I would be happy to take questions. Stephanie, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> they call me a mime at work because I do that all the time. Um, but uh, thank you. I wanted to, you know, this was fascinating and the pictures just make me want to grow roses. So um, <laughs> until we get to the end with the diseases and care and then I go, yeah. Oh, you but, know, I, Stephanie, I forgot to say, so, oh, rare good rose gardens. So Brookside Gardens, um, at one time, the Botanic Garden down at the foot of the Capitol had a beautiful, and it may still have, I just haven't been down there recently, a beautiful rose garden, and they were trying to grow those roses organically. So it would be interesting for you guys, if you're in the city, take a gander at the rose garden and see that, see how successful they have been yeah. um, on that. And those are the two big rose gardens I know of in our area. Um, someone mentioned uh, Fuller Gardens in um, New Hampshire. If you're up north, that's uh, oh yeah, a I know there are other rose gardens, other places <laughs> in the world. I'm saying here, 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 closer by. Um, we did have a comment from uh, Lynn. I don't know if you just want to go ahead and share that. <laughs> <laughs> if you can hear me, I <laughs> Um, it was just about the deer going after the roses. Have you had a lot of trouble with that? No, because I have a deer fence. No. I'm sorry. I cut right to the jugular. I have a deer <laughs> fence and I wouldn't garden without it. And so don't get me started on tick-borne diseases, all right? It's not just to protect um, my plants. It's to actually to protect me and my family. So I have a deer fence. Yes, deer love roses. I don't care how thorny they are. They must have like asbestos lips or something. I don't know. But um, I've, I've heard of, of hanging Irish spring, bags of human hair, milorganite, nothing really works. What is a deer fence? A deer fence. Okay, so I have, um, it's a two and a half inch by two and a half inch black polypropylene mesh. It goes eight feet tall and is pegged down at the bottom. You think everybody worries about them jumping over it. No, no, they're lazy. They're going to nose under it if they can get under it. <laughs> and because it's black and because I'm in the woods, all right, it disappears. It's really pretty invisible. And I am addicted to it. I, I would give up a lot of things before I would give up my deer fence. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. And by the way, if you're handy, you can put up deer fencing yourself. It's a little bit of a grunt. But I put up my deer fencing. I have about three quarters of an acre in deer fence. And it was me and about a half dozen of my able-bodied friends, a keg of beer and a barbecue. This is pre-COVID. <laughs> and we put up a deer fence in two four-hour sessions. So, yeah. 
Okay, <laughs> you can do it. Thank you. Very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that we're going to be ending the program in about five minutes, but all of this will be staying open and every and the Zoom call will continue for any other comments or questions you may have. Please continue. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions I can answer? No. All right. Now, I guess. Thank you so much. It was so pleasurable. Oh, uh, we have one question. Yeah. Oh, great. There I'm trying to mute myself. You talked about a rose that grows on the eastern shore. What about in, in Outer Banks? And I, where did I write that? I was trying to write. So, oh, uh, Rose Rugosa? Rugosa. Rugosa roses. They are tough, killer roses. Uh -huh. um, they're very, very thorny, but they do have that resistance to that salt water. And they like that sandy soil. They will grow in clay soil too. They want full, full sun. Um, and again, beautiful rose hips. I don't think they give you continuous bloom. They give you a good spring flush and then beautiful rose hips. You can make you rose hip jam. About, I'm sorry, Carol. You talked about it would make a nice hedge. Mm -hmm. So do I have to support it or will it grow no. up three, five feet? It's, it's a good sturdy shrub. I, I have actually used it. I used it in a, um, a small subdivision that wanted people to stop coming up the bank from the county road and getting into the back of the subdivision. And there, yeah. was, enough, there was enough sun there. And I put in Rosa Ragusa and it stopped the, the children from coming through. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's very effective, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, they were coming down the hill and just bursting out on the county road and it was a four lane county road and they were really worried Ooh. that the kids would get killed somebody get hurt yeah. so yeah made a good barrier <laughs> okay. All right. thank you so very much